Hi everyone. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Rachel, and today I'll be speaking about education for the future. Next slide, please. Uh, over the past seven years or so, I've been tilting more into education and seeing how I could support more Africans to have access to more global opportunities across the continent and more. So, next slide. Over the past 10 years or so, we've seen different trends when it comes to education, right? We've seen things like more people are being encouraged to go after STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics careers. Why? Because that's where the money is tilting towards. If you are not an Indian and your parents have been asking you to study, be a doctor and all of that in the past, now in Africa, a lot of our parents are encouraging us to go after more STEM educational part. Then we also saw the rise of Montessori, specifically in the aspect of schools, right? Children in K-12 educational part, they are being encouraged more to learn by doing, learn by actively, learn by actively practicing, right? How can we drive the creativeness of each kid beyond what they are being taught in classroom, increasing from their contact hours in class to having more time to do outside the classroom. Then COVID happened and things shook up, right? Next slide. With COVID, it brought a high rise in having more of MOOC courses, which are massive open online courses. A lot of people are tilting more towards online courses and working with their peers to actively learn more, peer reviews, peer mentorship, personalized learning, and with that came a very high dropout rate. Why? Because everybody is feeling, do I really have to be in the classroom? Which is what is driving the need for alternative education. Next slide, please. Why alternative education and why Africa? Every year in Nigeria alone, 1.3 million people write jump every year to get into high institution. And then, at the end of their four to five years of study, over 600 people graduate from school without the necessary skills to get into the market and do work, right? Personally, I went through a system in the Nigerian educational system and I was like, uh, you know what, this can't be it. I have to be part of the change that drives a bit of how can we do better? How can we empower the next generation to have access to the quality skills they need to move to where they need to be. And interestingly, in the US, the average age is 38 years old. In Canada, it's about 41 to 47 years old. While in Africa, the average age of any of the youth population is 19 years, which means we're literally the future of work. And empowering us to have the right skill is super important because if we don't have the right skill, it means the workplace of the future is going to be in shambles, right? Which is why alternative education is important, which is why every single person in this room is actively working towards learning the right skills they need to be do something better, to be able to drive change, to be able to build solutions, to be able to solve problems, right? Which is why alternative education is important. I had to literally tap into alternative education in my First, after my first year, in my second year in school, I was like, okay, this my curriculum is not going to get me to where I need to get to, which means I needed to start learning more. I needed to start actively empowering myself, right? Which is why a lot of efforts are pointing towards how can we empower people beyond what they are being taught in the classroom today, beyond what the educational system is providing them today. Next slide, please. Now, the future of education, is it open? or is it a closed system? Now, one of the reasons why we need to tilt towards an open educational system is because how can we use the principles of open source and then combine it with the current principles of education? Our curriculums need to be released early and often. I, just like I shared, when I was in school, I studied computer science and I was taught Fortran, COBOL, QBasic, and I'm sure you guys know that no one is using that programming language today, which means that I wasn't ready for the future, right? 
But our curriculums need to be updated. We need to have curriculums that are moving beyond the today's uh, 50 years to 100 years old curriculums. We just the way you push out uh, issues and get it merged via open source, you need to be able to update this curriculum day in, day out. Implement it as often as, say, four years, because technology is driving a kind of change that is pushing everybody to move fast. So if, the di if the technology is dynamic, then our curriculum needs to be dynamic. We can't stay behind. Also, we need to tilt towards more of uh, experiential learning, that is learning by doing. How can we work with individuals to have let me use this example. How can we tell individuals to experience what they are learning, right? Say I want to, today, okay, today this is my class, and today I would like to teach you about the digestive system. Now, the digestive system today, uh, you eat food, and then it goes through your throat, it goes through your small intestine, your large intestine, and then it comes out as feces at the end of the day, right? Uh, or, hi everyone, today I would like to teach you about the digestive system. And here's a picture of the digestive system. You get to see the food go through your mouth, goes through your throat, and then it comes down. Or, hi, today I would like to teach you about the digestive system. And then I give you a VR headset. And then you could literally see how the food is passing down and all of that. Now, at the end of the day, say five years down the line, which of these sessions would you remember? Most likely the VR one, because you experienced it, you could feel you could see how all of these processes were happening, which means we need to tilt away from theoretical to actively getting people to do as they learn, right? And because of that, we now have people who are more skilled to market ready. Someone like myself, at the time of graduating about four years ago, I was already ready to work in the ecosystem, right? And I was already working in the ecosystem before I even graduated, which is why it's important to drive more people to be contributing through open source and also contributing in their own school, which means there has to be collaboration between our teachers and the learners, right? Our educational system, our curriculums need to be more learner-driven. How can we get feedback from the learners that, oh, I think to an extent this might be a better way to teach me? Because right now we have systems that teach people how the system feels it should be teaching people. But we need to tilt more towards how can we teach people based on the feedback we're getting from them, providing the necessary tools to ensure that they succeed so we don't set people up for failure. Collaborative and transparent regulations. Right now, a lot of our curriculums are on, have a lot of like strict policies around them. And because they have a lot of strict policies around them, that means you can't switch a lot of things. Now, how can we empower our students student body, this could be SRC, student rep re representative councils, to work with educators. Put together all of this curriculum and also using this curriculum, you get to teach people. In class, we could have a session where I come into class and I'm like, hi guys, uh, over the next two weeks, we're going to be collaborating to review this curriculum. We're going to be collaborating to empower each and every one of you the right way. Now, with this collaboration and transparency, we get to drive innovation better. We get to have teachers who are actively, who are teaching kids to read, right? Why are they teaching kids to read? Because they are coming to class to see the teacher to find the teacher. Next slide, please. So, open source and educating the workforce. Our educational system, or the education for the future, needs to be more open, it needs to be more secure, and it needs to be merit-based. Why? Because... Today, when you go to send in a, maybe you're contributing to a project, and then you send in your, uh, your review or whatever, it gets to be reviewed. You're not the only person sending that contribution. There are multiple people sending that contribution. And it's the best one that fits the system that gets merged, right? Because nobody wants to merge nonsense. Which is why education in the future needs to be more open. And because you have an entire ecosystem of people collaborating to make this work, it's it is more secure because, it's like I said, you have an entire community of people. Which means, interestingly, just a sideline, interestingly, over 500,000 
what of invested into attacking educational platforms, schools, this could be true scandals, this could be true attacking their curriculums, this could be attacking their students' data. Now, if you have an entire open source community hearing that, ah, they don't attack our school, though, and everyone has a vested interest into improving this educational system, then there would be a great community driving change, ensuring that nobody is, nobody's data is out there, which is why education for the future needs to stay open. Improved teaching methodologies. Teaching is a noble profession, and I'm a strong believer that people who, should, who don't want to teach should not be teaching, which is why I am not, I'm not a great fan of how NYSE handles sending people to go teach. Like, you just got out of camp, they are like, oh, go and teach in this school. If it's for people, for people who want to teach, that's okay. But for people who don't want to teach, it means there's going to be a break in the learning process, right? You have teachers who really don't want to be there. You now have students who are not getting the right educational support they need to learn. And with that, it just messes the entire thing up, which is why we need to find a way with open source, we're able to improve how teaching methodologies are being carried out. We're able to empower teachers with the right skills, the right people who want to teach, who feel this is something that I was called to do, are able to provide the right learning tools to students. Collaboration for more strategic learning. Open source ensures that people are tilting away from competitiveness, which means the future of education is every single EdTech platform, every school, single school, are all collaborating together to build curriculums, to pass on teaching, not just uh, the government designed this curriculum and placed it in front of all of the schools and they are telling them, oh, go and implement this. And then every school is being competitive, trying to take students from the other school. Now we are driving for collaboration. And once you are collaborating, it means that you have more time for strategic thinking. You have students who are able to who are able to suggest recommend who are able to recommend tactics that can improve how they are being taught right and because every single one of us is working towards one goal one goal being how can i make the world a better place that means we now all collectively have a sense of global citizenship we are not just working on oh, today I am a student in this school, and today I am working on this project, oh, today I am working on this solution for Nigeria, I am working on this solution for Kenya, I am working on this solution for, Ish, for China. Now we are all working together to build a solution for the world. And that is a system we need to build, not every man for himself. And education needs to be driven that way. Next slide, please. So, if education needs to be driven that way, we need people who will drive it, right? Which is why we have more contributors, software engineers, product managers, program managers collaborating to open source projects. And all of that data gets into the middle of the system where VR, AR, AI, and robots are actively taking all of this data and then pushing it on the other end. And pushing it to the other end because you have sufficient data that are highly that are being, uh, what's the word, that are being processed by AI and robots, they now can build systems at scale that can drive bioengineering. Bioengineering, where we get to study our matter, our bodily fluid, and all of that, which can help us start teleportation. I love to travel, but I don't like the traveling process. I sometimes wish I could just click my heels three times and get to a place, right? And with technology, we're able to achieve that. Then from there, we get to kind of like expand beyond what today's physics is, go deeper into quantum physics. Our time is no longer getting, us being in the 21st century is no longer limiting because we now get to understand quantum physics and how it applies to time travel. Every single person here can afford to travel to another planet, not just within our ecosystem, but outside. Right now, it's only people like Musk and Bezos that can afford it. I want to travel around the world. And how we empower educators of today to empower the knowledge that is being put out there is going to greatly impact the kind of solutions we're building that can even expedite our growth as a planet. Next slide, please. Our goal at all school 
Yeah, I work at old school, so allow me to talk about old school for a bit. Our goal at old school by 2030 is to empower 10 million students, right, uh, through all of our programs. Now, how do we want to do that? By ensuring that every single African first, African first, because our, how we drive things is building for Africans by Africans, empowering the African community to have the tools they need to to have the tools they need to go out there and change things in the world. Just now, Anidi wrapped up a session around why the A in EMEA is silent. And we want to make that A to be more pronounced. And how do we do that? Is by educating the future. Next slide, please. Our goal, democratizing access to quality education. Not just tech education, but every education at all school, in, on all levels. Next slide. We have three schools. Right, School of Engineering, School of Products, and School of Design. And we have an advanced program that just wrapped up their cohorts too. Special shout out to one of my guys here, Jerry, uh, for making that happen. And next slide, please. And our graduates from our first cohort of program are working at several companies such as Andela, Flona, Toptal, Yelp, Octosoft, Sterling Bank, and etc. Next slide, please. What's our mission? Like our mission at Old School, and also my mission here today, is to encourage you to take your future into your own hands, to go out there, build better solutions, to go out there, challenge how things are being done today, is to go out there, empower the next person sitting next to you. It could be to empower your younger one, it could be to empower another person, to be able to build solutions that can take that can change where things are today. Because we have a lot of, we have potential, but how we educate today's people is going to greatly impact what the world is going to be in the next five, 10 decades, right? And it starts from us today. It starts from us deciding that we are not going to sit with the redundant curriculum we have today. It starts from us saying that we are going to adapt to a new learning system. It starts from us today saying that we are going to, we're going to drive a change that is beyond what anyone is able to offer today. And how that happened is every single one of us deciding that we're going to learn and build products that are sustainable. It starts from us deciding that we are not building for ourselves, we're building for our kids. It starts from us building for the next generation. And building for the next generation sometimes entails making compromises, making sacrifices. No community, no generation makes a change without making sacrifices. And this sacrifice today has to be from our end. It means we have to push ourselves, push our limits, push our learning limits. If today we were studying for say five hours a day, it means we need to be studying for maybe another extra hour, right? And for us to do that, we have to greatly tap into all of the resources we have. How can we contribute more to open source? How can we build with collaboration in mind and not competition? So keep learning and keep building sustainably. Next slide, please. Because we understand that building sustainably requires money and build, learning requires money, uh, my team at Old School and the team at Oscar have collaborated to offer 50% off tuition in all of our programs for anyone who signs up from now until 30th of June. So if you have people who you think might benefit from this, please let them know. This is 50% off tuition. You still get to pay the application fee, FYI. Uh, thank you so much. Next slide. Yes. Thank you. Uh, questions, questions, questions. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Do you guys have questions? Any questions, please? Any question? Okay, sure. Can we get the previous slide again? Okay, previous slide, please. Okay. okay. Previous slide, please. Yeah, um, my name is David, by the way. I Hi, have one, one specific question. How do you get to follow up students all around Africa? How do you get to follow them up? You know, one thing about learning and self-thought, like the percentage of us here are self-thought developers. Yeah. How do you promote learning online 
and also following up out school online without um, interrupting your everyday life? Uh, so, the skill or the, the technique we've used that has been quite effective is ensuring that we have a very active community. And I mean, it's because you are part of the Oscar community, that's why you're here, right? Our students also are self-starters. We encourage our students to be self-starters. And I know I have some of them in the room. Hi, guys. <laughs> yeah, so our students are self-starters. And this is because we believe that as much as you need a community to drive you forward, you also need, uh, you need to drive yourself, right? There are people, it's not always that people will be able to support you. And while we actively try to check in on people, we also build accountability groups, that is the learning circles. Everybody in a learning circle is responsible for the growth of everybody in that other learning circle, right? So all of this kind of like, it's picking people up. When I come to Twitter and I see my students saying, oh, uh, this person supported me during this hard time and all of that, that is a community, right? Isolating yourself will keep you behind. You know this phrase, this quote, uh, if you want to move fast, go alone if you want to move far go in a group i have moved this far because i have a community so tap tie yourself into a community and that would really help thank you yeah sorry yes hello everyone Hi. my name is white god kingsley i'm a front-end engineer and um i came into i i work actively with a company but i'm looking at i've been looking for opportunities where i can uh give back to uh, the tech community and yeah. I, my question is as someone who is trying to find um, people because uh, to kind of help them through their learning process and I believe um, old school is a fantastic place to do that so how how do you select your instructors is there a way to apply or something yeah <coughs> and all of that that's one and then also <coughs> I noticed that the learning curve for especially the, um, the learning curve for software engineers in general is, is not linear True. and I, and most of the times uh, I've been lucky enough because I'm self-taught, I've been lucky enough to understand that how that curve goes and I've helped about two engineers come into tech and I'm also looking at um, helping much more people at scale. So I don't know if um, the platform is flexible to, because you talked about collaborating and all of that um, in building curriculums, that is the platform open to change and all of that yeah. contribution from other people? Thank you so much for your question. Uh, so your first question regarding how we select our instructors and all of that, we are a community driven platform. So we work with the community basically. That, but mainly we ask for recommendations and some of our instructors actually reached out to us so that if something you're interested in you can reach out to us and then although you would have to go through our screening process uh, before you get assigned as an instructor or you could also mentor right uh, with mentorship that's a more we, you will still go through the screening process but that is easier than actually being an instructor I hope that answers your question Yes. Then the second question regarding uh, collaborating on the curriculum. We have a system of updating our curriculum every year, like not even every year. We get feedback from our students and we're already updating. I think you know, right now the people in version 1 Python and people in version 2 Python are doing entirely different things. That's because of the feedback we got from the previous, uh, from the previous cohort. Now, for you to collaborate with us on our curriculum is to reach out and say, oh, I would love to see how I means we get support from different people it still goes through like a main process because we don't want just like i said uh everybody thinks they know something but to an extent there has to be that that system of transparency and also meritocracy right so if you're able to provide recommendations we get that we check based on the next five to ten years is this recommendation going to be valuable or not is it if it's going to be valuable we combine it to our curriculum Thank you. So we'll take one last question. All right. Um, thank okay, you. Two. Okay, yes. Okay. So my question is around like, you know, you talked about like building like a global community, yeah. right? And I feel like it is best if we can start like, oh, sorry. It is best if we can like start like when people are like very, very young, right? Yeah. So how do you think like we can put something like this into our educational system, like in Africa generally? Yeah. 
Thank you so much. So that's an excellent question because uh, for us to be able to make a lasting change, a sustainable change, it means that we need to go back, right? And going back being that we would have included in our current curriculum in from is it basic no from primary school, right? Add all of the whatever needs to be added to that curriculum to make it more effective. Uh, how do we do that? It's working with the government. There needs to be active public private partnerships, right? Collaborating with them to understand that see the startup ecosystem alone has shown you that we've moved past whatever it is is being taught in class. Work with NITDA, work with uh, NCT. Work with them to work on, like, I know the Startup Act has a part in it that allows for change. When it's going to be implemented, I'm not sure, but if we can drive that conversation, this is a conversation that we can even drive online. The good thing is right now I've seen that sometimes the government is taking some form of advice online. So if we can drive this conversation on Twitter, on Instagram, or whatever, talking about our curriculum needs to be updated. If we go as a mass and then drive this conversation, it should push the government to say, okay, set up a committee and let's improve the curriculum. But yes, I agree that if we're going to have a lasting change, we need to start from the curriculum way back so that at the time people are getting to secondary school to university, they have sufficient knowledge to get them even further. Like some of us are here, you might have been done with higher institution and that is when you are learning this skill. Assuming you learned it in, say, secondary school or in university, I'm sure you would have gone so much further. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I'm Hi. Khalid. I'm the Hi, committee Khalid. manager and also an emergency system engineer. And um, currently, I'm working with my school. I'm trying to draft out a curriculum for engineering students and yep. how they can fit into the new startup board. There's a collaboration. Now, um, my question is, um, how do you, like, as a teacher, uh, as a teacher or a lecturer or in the academic uh, field, how do you contribute to open source? Yeah, that's your thing. Okay. As an educator, how do you contribute to open source? Uh, so, beyond, you don't have to be a software engineer, I'm sure. All of these sessions today has been telling you, you don't have to be a software engineer to contribute to open source. There are a lot of projects out there that uh, on GitHub or even collaborating with people within the open source community, you might not know about them. But talking to people like, say, Ruth Ikega, people like uh, Samson, mainly the people who lead the Oscar community, they're able to direct you to community. is by collaborating as a program manager, not necessarily as a software engineer or a designer. So if you're collaborating as a program manager, you have access to uh, projects that you can contribute to. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you. Okay. Sorry, David again here. Hi, um, David. One more specific question. Okay. I, I teach with sabiteach.com. I yeah. teach programming C++ to students they give yeah. me to teach. That is one thing I, I had an issue finding a job. I had an issue finding a job. I met my engineering friend. He told me that, David, do you have a certification? Like, I noticed that we don't have a general certification that proves that we are all developers. Yeah. Lawyers have. I think accountants have. Engineers have. They go to engineering school. Even doctors have. So does out school give us the opportunity to have this certified developer from out school that makes us stand out like I, people that did I can people that went to bar that went to law school and cool. Thank you so much for that question. So yes, a lot of I can uh, is it I C C A there's a lot of them. Uh, sorry. Yeah, A C C N right? Yeah. So a lot of these organized industries have their own specific certification and it would be it would be awesome for us to have some. Um, I do know that there's the Google developer experts, there's the Google Cloud Professional there's the AWS certified. There are all of those things. In old school, we offer a diploma, right? And this diploma kind of like certifies you that you have skill in software engineering, in product management, product design. We are working towards building a more standard and kind of like central certification program. And with that, we're able to kind of like support software engineers who need that proof of concept, basically. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate it.